Oh, hello everybody and welcome to another event. Uh, welcome to the Nomen channel, whatever channel you're watching it on. Uh, excited to have another awesome event for you today. Uh, today we're doing the animated short film Namu, uh, Behind the Creative Process and the Making of. Uh, very excited about this event. We have a lot of cool stuff today. Uh, I just ended up watching it, uh, which we'll be doing uh, today during the stream. And it's a really beautiful short film, uh, just really... Really beautiful. Uh, you can tell that a lot of work and handcrafted work was put into this. So I'm very excited for that. Uh, just some housekeeping stuff to get out of the way. First off, this event is sponsored by Lenovo. Lenovo makes it possible for us to sponsor these types of events and put these types of events on. So very special thank you to them. Uh, and then another piece of housekeeping. If you need closed captioning, our Facebook stream has auto live captions. So if you need that, please head over to our Facebook and you can go ahead and check that out there. Uh, those out of the way, let's go ahead and just jump into it. Uh, tonight we, we have a really awesome panel, and we also are going to, like I said, watch the short itself. Uh, but as I start introducing our guests, we have a couple people here. And the first I'm going to introduce is the, uh, the writer-director, Eric O. Uh, Eric is an Oscar-nominated filmmaker whose films have been introduced and awarded at numerous film festivals, including the Annie Awards, the Annecy, Anima, Seagraph, Anima Mundi, with a background in fine art and Seoul, uh, in Seoul National University and film school at UCLA, Eric became an animator at Pixar from 2010 to 2016. He then directed Pig, The Dam Keeper Poems, which won the Crystal at Annecy in 2018. His recent project, Opera, was, nominate, was nominated for this year's Academy Award for Best Animated Short, and Eric joined Baobab Studios to create Namu, and will be working with a variety of projects in film and animation, and will also contribute to contemporary art scene in the USA and South Korea. A little bit about Baobab Studios, they're a nine-time award-winning studio. Uh, they are a world leader in independent interactive animation and was recently named by Fast Company in 2018 as the most interactive company, uh, which is pretty incredible. The studio, the studio is creatively led by writer-director writer -director Eric Darnell, and in addition, then uh, they also have created a ton of amazing things. There's a, such a long list here with uh, Nemu, Invasions, Asteroids, Jack, Crow the Legend, Bonfire, and Baba Yaga, and also recently uh, executive produced Paper Birds Part 1 and 2. They have had such amazing stars in their projects like Oprah, John Legend, Ali Wong, Kate Winslet, Daisy Ridley, Glenn Close, L Lupita Nyong'o, Jennifer Hudson, Edward Norton, Diego Luna. The list goes on and on. The, it's such an incredible studio and very excited to have all of them here. Uh, several of the projects are also currently being adapted into books, films, games, and original series, and more. Oh, all right, to get that out of the way, that is a long set of intros for all the people in the amazing studio we have here, but today we have Eric. Oh, I'm going to start introducing and bringing you all on the stream with me. Eric, uh, oh, I just overrode. Hello there. Uh, we have Eric. We also have Nick Ladd joining us. We have uh, the art, which was the lead quill artist. We also have our art director, Asong Lee. We have our editor, Vanessa Rojas, and we have the producer slash head of content for Baobab, Kane Lee. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Very excited to have you all on our stream. All right. Uh, let's kind of just jump into it. Uh, I figured, Eric, you were the writer director, so do you want to just kind of start us off and kick this thing? Yeah, of course. Um, thank you so much. That was a long, awesome intro. <laughs> Yeah. Amazing job over there for making us look awesome. Um, yeah, it's an honor for us to be here all together. And um, Namu, it's a 12-minute short. Um, it's about tree of life. Um, Namu means tree in Korean. So it goes through this one character's life from his birth to all the way to the last chapter of his life. One of the interesting and unique things about this film is that it's entirely done by VR Quill. Not sure some of you are just, uh, you know, uh, familiar with the software or not, but we will, you know, talk about it in a in depth level. So, yeah, we're gonna share this uh, film together, and then followed by a presentation put together by myself, also Nick Led, one of our main quill artists, and then Josh, you will moderate a Q and A with everybody else. Right? Yep, we'll be having questions uh, at the end. So, if anybody during the stream has questions during the film or the presentations, uh, go ahead and type into the chat, and I will queue them up for the end. Great. Cool. Did we want to start off by watching the short? Should we do okay. that? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Without further ado. Right, here enjoy. we go. Thank you. Go. Hi, everyone. This is John Cho. And as executive producer of Namu, I'm proud to present the film to you today. I was moved by this film's human message 
as well as the craftsmanship and innovation that made this a little miracle during the pandemic by artists working around the world with my partners at Baobab Studios and director Eric O. Oh. Wish I could be there with all of you and I hope you enjoy our special presentation of Namo.
All right. There we go. That is a beautiful film, Eric. It's Thank you. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. Um, I know you guys have a presentation, but yeah, I just wanted to first off say it's, it's really beautiful. I love the the storytelling that, you know, it, there's no words needed to tell that story, but I think it says a lot, and I think that's really cool in the way that you've created a film that, that um, says so much with, with so little, but at the same time has so much there. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting the, I'm reading the, all the comments. Thank you for all the love. It's yeah. amazing, you guys. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, do you want to jump straight into your presentation? Yeah, why don't I do that while everyone right, is let's do digesting, it. processing what you guys just watched. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. <laughs> all right, let's go like this. Awesome. And I'm going to remove myself from it, but uh, I'll see you in a bit. Great. All right, thank you, guys. Thank you so much once again. So, yeah, um, we have a little mini presentation we put together to share how we made Namu. Um, it really starts from this little picture I love to share. This is the photo almost like 20, 30 years ago. That's me, that little boy, that's me. <laughs> and that's my grandfather. And we are both wearing hanbok, that traditional Korean costume. I was, I was raised in Korea, so that was my childhood. And then uh, my grandfather uh, in the picture, he passed away about 10 years ago. And he was an amazing person I truly looked up to. And it was a bit of a sudden goodbye. So none of us in our family member were, was prepared for this. So it was tough, it was tough. And then it was really my first time experiencing um, losing, losing someone who was really close to you. So of course it got me think a lot about your life, where we come from, where we go after this, what we leave behind and all those. And during this grieving process, I make this little, drawings just for myself, almost like a diary, almost like a picture book diary. And then um, a story of a man who hangs his memory to his own tree. And I never actually shared this with anybody at the time because of course I was emotionally very overwhelmed. So um, as you can see here, some of the things you guys watched is it's already there, but you know, this core idea of the, the story was already sort of designed or written 10 years ago when grandfather passed away. So basically I put that deep into my mental drawer and I moved on. And I was still a student at the time and I graduated. And then I uh, went to the studio Pixar and I was there about seven years. And then I made many short films, um, some, some short film, very small independent, while some are big like uh, the Dan Keeper poems or opera um, as Josh uh, um, shared. It was amazingly luckily nominated Oscar for this year. But anyways, I made so many different various films. And not only my career, my life kept on moving too. Um, um, I don't have a baby yet. That's not my baby, just to get to know. But that's my sister's baby. My youngest sister had a newborn child, um, like a, a birth of my niece. And then uh, on the left, that's my dad um, holding my niece's hands. And in the middle, of course, that's me. And on the right, that's the cemetery where my grandfather is at. So as my life moving forward, I had a little inner calling that maybe this is about time. And that was about two years ago to take this idea out of my mental drawer and share it with people. And then um, I was at the time, as I said, it was two years ago. I was at the time um, visiting Korea uh, just to visit my family. And there was just a month trip. And then uh, Kane Lee, the producer of, of Namu, was actually happened to be there too. We were friends even before then and we were having coffee together and that's when I actually shared this idea just verbally and then Kane was like hey let's try something together let's see and then that's how that's the, really the origin of, uh, of, of how this project is started so basically as soon as I you know made up my mind to actually tell this story I went back to this painting and this is a painting I also did 10 years ago when I did that little drawing of the men and again, this became the root of the entire production and everything started from here. One of the first artists I talked to was Ah Sung Lee, the, uh, the art director who's also here with us. He's gonna be on, on, on with us in, in a Q&A session. Um, 
he's not only, first of all, great friend of mine. He's not only a great friend of mine, but he's an also amazing art director who specialized in color and lighting. Because as you just saw, this film is all about passage of time, telling the street through story through mood and, and, and colors. So to me, he was the best fit for it. And on top of that, he's also Korean American. So there are a lot of things we were able to share, like without explaining too, too much, right? So here are some of the early concept art he did. And he literally took everything to the next level. And um, here are uh, here is the early color script. And um, one thing about the story is that it really goes through the changes in season. It starts, as you can see from the top line, it starts from the spring, which is all about newborn. It's white canvas. We don't have much colors. We don't have much like materials. We have a lot of reading rooms. And as the boy grows and the tree grows, we have many more colors coming in. The more materials, more stuff, more objects, that's when we go to the summer, full of life and youth. Yeah, I, I see a lot of like compliments on the lighting. You'll, you'll have awesome soon. <laughs> um, then after passing some of the heavy low moments in life, we got into, we get into fall. And, and then winter comes next, which would connect all the way back to the spring. So that's the really main core concept of how we dealt with the passage of time. And here's a little more extended version of the color script. And as, as you can see at a, at a glance, we really work hard to capture the, 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 the you know, expressions, emotions through colors and warmth, you know, and the lighting of the day and night, difference in weathers and climates and seasons, you know, um, at a glance, you can even already track emotional arc and where the character is, you know, through the colors change. And then, of course, the color was extremely important. The shape of the tree itself was extremely important as well. For example, this is, you know, the early drawings I did. And, and when the tree is young, you know, you can see individual objects. You see pacifier, you see plush doll, and some of the toys and then drawings and all those. But what's another, you know, interesting thing is it doesn't really have the particular shape. And that also represents our childhood. You know, when you're young, we are full of potential and identity is still building. You're still learning. You're still absorbing like a sponge. And then, and then you can be anything, right? But as you grow, as you age, you start to have your own shape. You're still start to draw, drawing your own life. And it really basically represents each life stage we go through. For example, on the on the top left, you see the uh, heart shaped tree, and that's literally when you meet the love of your life. And on the bottom, it's falling apart. It's it's uh it's it's the all distorted, ugly looking, and that's when you are you know when you feel like everything's falling apart. We all have experienced that rock bottom where you don't want to even see yourself into the mirror, and you want to ignore and deny who you are. That's what that uh, tree is. And then on the top left, on top right, I mean, top right, you see this moon shape. Um, it's, and it has a huge hole in, in the middle that really showcases that this emptiness you have that cannot be fulfilled with anything else. So it's really that status. And then, but no matter what, but the, at the end of the day, after going through all these ups and downs, you will finally find your own balance and create your own tree. So that that's, uh, symbolizes that one perfect sphere on the right bottom. So Asang and I went over many actually different directions in the beginning. Here are some early concept art. As you can see, we also tried putting leaves too to make the, to support some of the colors and, and uh, design of the objects, you know, um, and then we also even played around the, the change in the materialism, like basically on the right, it, almost like a plastic vinyl, like capturing. So we actually really tried this and that. But later, we kind of went back to the original version we, you know, we came up with in the beginning. Without any leaves, we're just going to go with the objects. So going through many different visual explorations, here's the final key master art we landed. And we all fell in love with it. So now, Next thing we had to think about 
was how to execute this, how to bring this beautiful painting and the story I put together and all the designs and all these thoughts into life. And I just thought, um, you know, this is something I was uh, discussing with Kane at the time, but I just thought there could be something more than just linear storytelling. Because from the beginning, I kind of wanted the audience to be part of the story so that they can observe deeply what's happening and then find themselves in the story. And that is when I thought about VR, virtual reality. And as you guys know, um, I'm not sure in the room who, how many of you have experienced this VR headset, experiencing VR content. It is all about immersiveness and experience. And that is exactly what the story of Namu needed, in my opinion. So cinema, if you think about it, cinema and VR are two different mediums, like oil painting and watercolor, or different language, like Korean or English, uh, even though they may seem alike. You know, in cinema, you can control everything, literally. You can control camera movement, like there's panning, close-ups, zooming in, like depth of field, pacing, cuts, all sort of cuts, actually, dissolves or fading in and out, edits pacing and all those things. That's what we call uh, cinema, a uh, language of cinema, right? And that's how we welcome the audience to the story. Well, in VR, actually none of those are necessarily possible. I mean, it's not impossible, but then with those, you just make film, right? You know, VR kind of has its own like strength. Then why, why VR, you know? Um, VR really takes you to another reality. When it rains, like as you just saw, the version you saw is cinematic version, but the, when it rains, it rains on you. When you're flying in the air, you're actually flying in the air on the tree. And then, and then the tree is basically growing in front of you, and you are free to observe like what the, how the tree is growing from any angle. You can even lean forward to take a close look at what the boy is painting. So, you know, I couldn't, you know, um, I mean, cinema and VR, both amazing medium. But we ended up getting super greedy and decided to make both. Why not when you can make both? The same story, the same emotion, but two different experiences. And that is when I decided to use the Quill. Quill is a VR application developed by Meta, previously Oculus, Facebook Oculus. Um, again, not sure how many of you is, uh, are familiar with this software. But um, it's a VR software that enables artists to draw, paint, and animate intuitively in CG virtual space. So for me, as a first-time uh, VR director, VR storyteller, Quill was a perfect tool because I was, again, of course, super intimidated and scared by this high-end VR technology. But Quill was kind of opposite. Even though it is high-end technology, it really enables artists to be free from all these technical restrictions and as re be creative as much as you can be. So that's how I ended up taking Quill as the main software of, of this film. And also the look and the style uh, of the Quill had, you know, uh, could achieve was quite as impressive. So here I'd love to um, invite our uh, lead Quill artist, Nick Ladd, and to tell you more about what Quill is, how and how we actually made the film. So yeah, Nick, please take it away. Thanks. So yeah, my name is Nick Ladd, and I was the lead quill artist on Namu. Uh, and really, my my uh, my my role was to help Eric bring his vision from two D into the world of virtual reality uh, using the tool Quill. And so Quill, as Eric said, is basically a VR art creation and animation software, and it's uh, it's free if you have a VR headset if you have an Oculus device. And it's used to paint, draw, and animate in 3D space. So you can make 3D worlds, you can paint them in the air, and then you can live in them and you can animate. If you've ever used Photoshop or any um, 2D animation software, it's almost like one of those, but if you were to bring it into 3D space. So this is a picture of me before I shaved uh, using Quill, painting the environment from Namu. And as you can see, I have a timeline. I have a color palette. I have various windows that I can use to create. Uh, and how it works exactly is sort of like you can see in these two uh, videos. On the left, you can see I'm creating strokes. So just by drawing and pulling the trigger, I can make lines. 
and you can also then manipulate any line that you create. So using Quill, you can basically take um, an, an artist like me with an illustration background, and you can have them create 3D uh, in a very intuitive and also very fun way. So one of the key benefits of Quill and why we used it is because by allowing an artist to paint in 3D, you wind up with a much more stylized uh, visual uh, language than you would in 3D than by doing it kind of in a traditional way, or at least in a way that's uh, very accessible for, for artists and illustrators to create 3D artwork um, that looks and actually is handcrafted. So we worked very closely with, we being the quill artist, worked very closely with Ah Song Lee, the art director, who created Photoshop concept art for us, as you can see on the left. And on the right, you can see the quill version, which we're able to paint uh, directly in 3D based on that concept art. And working in, in quill is a lot like working on um, dolls and miniatures. Everything you make in quill, you do with your with your own hands. You're grabbing strokes, you're grabbing characters, you're posing characters, you're moving them. It feels like um, creating miniatures, it feels like uh, playing with dolls. It's nothing like um, working on other types of animation. Uh, 3D animation is all very technical. You're moving uh, vertices, you're moving graphs, you're, you're kind of perfecting everything. And this film, although we were very meticulous, had a level of handcraftedness that was um, very different than anything else you might you might see out there. Uh, it had a very different pipeline. And here's another example of some of the concept art and how we translate that into characters. Uh, so at the top, you can see the, the original sketches. And at the bottom, those are the 3D models that we painted in Quill based on those. And an interesting tidbit that you can see here, uh, especially in the middle character, is that in Quill, um, you have full creative control. Most 3D software, you can place lights and you can um, kind of alter every tiny little detail using the uh, software. But in Quill, the artist has full creative control over every single element, um, like a painting, more, more like a painting than a 3D scene. So the lighting is not <clears throat> generated by Quill. The lighting, sorry, yeah, lighting is not generated by Quill. The lighting is generated by the artist. You paint individual strokes, and those strokes can be different colors, and that's really how you have to do your lighting. So to get lighting as beautiful as Namu's, we needed to work very closely with Ah Song Lee to paint that directly into the character art so that we knew as artists, this is the lighting for this scene, this is lighting for that character. And that will be more apparent, I think, in a coming slide. Um, as a very technical breakdown, uh, this is how the Quill characters are kind of constructed. So on the right is the, the finished, complete version of, a, of the character. That's basically when you're working in Quill, that's what you're seeing. But if you're a 3D artist and you know about 3D background, basically if you, if you take it into another software and you turn off all the colors and you do a bunch of stuff, you'll see that the strokes are very kind of messy. Um, and underneath those strokes, it's nothing but a series of curves. So every line you can see on the left one is, it's kind of messy because they're on top of each other, but each color is basically a line, and all those lines you can bend and distort. So um, when you're posing characters, it's actually a lot like a stop motion film. Uh, you're really grabbing the character, grabbing his hand, grabbing his head, grabbing his knee. And for every frame of animation in the film, you're posing him again and again and again. So anybody who's ever worked uh, in a, on a 3D film before is probably used to character rigs uh, which you then pose, and then you make another pose, and the computer can kind of figure out what's in between. And then you can look at the various uh, kind of graph editor, and you can adjust how fast things happen. In Namu or in Quill, we didn't quite have that luxury. We had to treat it like a stop motion film and really model and shape every single frame one after another to create the illusion of animation. Uh, and that meant we were animating kind of like a... Um, like a 2D animated film with keyframes, breakdowns, and then in-betweens all done one at a time by the artist. And this GIF shows the same process where as you animate, you get a uh, an onion skin 
approach where I'm moving this ball one frame at a time and I can see where the previous one is and I'll see where the next one is. And this is how we did all the animation of the characters and the environment for Nemo. Uh, again, here's another example. This is a, a shot where I'm moving a car through the scene and it's kind of being sucked up into the tree. So every frame I move it, I compare it to where it was before. And then I also use kind of the grab tool to make it stretch. So a lot of 2D animation has squash and stretch when things kind of start moving faster. Uh, we fake that in Nemu by literally stretching the geometry of an object just by switching tools and pulling on it. So you can see that here at the end. Um, and there was a few other ways we could animate and we did animate. One of those is with the kind of anim brush technique where you can draw lines and they'll reanimate exactly how you drew them. So you can create sort of living lines. Uh, we use this for certain things like raining effects. Uh, and also we used it for timing guides. So when I animated scene like this, I could kind of give myself an outline of how fast and how far I wanted uh, objects to move before I then move them frame by frame. Uh, you can also puppet things in Quill, which is something we use a few times for a few scenes where you can basically just grab it, act out the motion, sort of like a uh, motion capture, and then the character would re repeat your uh, your motion essentially. So uh, you could use your hand to kind of uh, puppet things. Um, and for the audio in Quill, it's not quite as uh, present in the cinematic version that was just played, but for the VR version, uh, all the sounds are kind of spatialized around you. And you can actually grab these audio sources in Quill and place them physically in the 3D space to, uh, to get a sense of, uh, you know, if something's further away, it'll be less loud. If it's on your right, you'll hear it on your right. If it's on the left. With the VR headset, you have that full spatial 3D audio experience. And Quill makes it really easy to uh, not only place those sounds, but you can also animate them if they move throughout the scene. Um, so working with Eric uh, was a really interesting process in Quill because Eric is a 2D artist from a 2D background, uh, or at least not a, not from a VR background. And so the best way that we found to do notes was we would take images from the film uh, in VR and then Eric could do 2D drawovers and then we would bring those images back into Quill and we would use those as a guide. So he would say, okay, the hair needs to be down here, the character should be sitting up, uh, various things like this. So you can see this is kind of a feedback session between us and VR and Eric uh, outside of VR. Here's another panel kind of showing that. So basically cleaning up our poses essentially uh, for the animation. Uh, and here's kind of an example of how we took a scene from the very beginning to the very end. So where we started with every scene was usually a rough drawing. So this was just a storyboard panel from Eric, a very simple outline of what the tree should look like. And then Ah Song Lee uh, would come in and he would design like a proper concept art piece for it. So this is what the scene should look like with the lighting and the props and the shadows and everything. We would recreate that in Quill uh, to a certain extent. And then, um, I don't know why this, oh, of course. Uh, and then Eric would come in and do kind of a 2D animated version of that scene. So character would come in, do his thing. And then uh, once this kind of was, was done, we would then move on to Quill again, where we would uh, come in and animate the character frame by frame like I was showing before. So that was kind of the process for a scene uh, like this one. Uh, same here. Uh, we'd start with early sketch, uh, kind of a layout concept art to get a sense of everything. We would paint all that concept art uh, directly in Quill. And then uh, Eric would come in, do a, do a pass with his uh, 2D animation. And then finally, we would come in and do our final 3D pass uh, directly in VR with Quill to do the characters, the environments, and uh, finalize uh, all of that stuff. And this is the cinematic version, which also had a little bit of bloom uh, and some post-processing on top as well to really um, enhance the look. And with that, I'm passing it back to Eric, who's going to speak about, um, I think, uh, some of the audio. Cool. 
Yes, thank you, Nick. Um, so basically, I mean, our, our, our talk is almost over, but just want to touch upon briefly about the music and audio. So music, as you can see, as even Josh in the beginning uh, touched upon, there's no dialogue. It's only music and sound. So music was a, one of the big critical elements of the story. So this is our composers, Zach Johnson and Matt, Matt Roberts. And I worked with them you know, previously with other uh, um, films I made previously uh, with the Dan Keeper short that was out in 2015 and the Dan Keeper poems um, um, in 2018. They were just amazing with this, you know, this type of a sentimental, very, you know, uh, um, you know, melancholy, but beautiful melody line and this orchestration. So, you know, without any hesitation, I grabbed them right away. And then what was interesting was usually when filmmaking, the, the music score comes into play almost uh, late in the game, almost as a post-production. But again, just to hear myself, because the music was such a big part, I talked to them almost right after I talked to Awesome, almost in the pre-production before uh, I had all, any specific storyboards, I reached out to them and then pitched this story, you know, and my experience, more like my personal anecdote. And then thankfully they were very moved and very resonated with the story I, I was gonna tell. And they were like, hey, let's do it. So from, from that part on, they actually, without thinking about orchestration or, or what type of element we're gonna play, but you know, they just with their own piano, they start writing very variety of different scratch musics. So uh, we had about like 10, 15, you know, different uh, um, scratches of we would buy piano, but um in the in the before, after a month or two exploration, we were able to lock down that's the melody, that's the tone I'd love to get. And then, and then already in the sort of like uh, halfway in the production, you know, the artists were able to actually start listening to the score that will be you know, on in the film. Like that's very different from, you know, usual, again, typical pipeline because we never, we just get to temp score or we don't get to hear anything, but their music actually became the critical inspiration for the visuals and like ended up being that way. Of course, when the visual is done, they came in, you know, um, and, and, and then rewrite everything to the visual. So basically their process was like a sandwich. In the beginning, they were there to set up the tone and then they just put their hands off for the entire production and they came back to finalize and do the final music writing for the film. And of course, the 2D, I mean, the cinematic version and VR version were two different things. And, and then we also have Vanessa, who's the editor of the, of the film. You know, um, you know, we have whole different pacing in 2D animation. So basically they also had to like rewrite two different versions for the two different mediums. And here we also have to mention Andrew Vernon, uh, amazing sound designer who also work, uh, I worked with for many, many films of mine previously, including one of my recent short opera. Um, um, I've been really, as a friend, friends with them for over 10 years, I guess, you know, but without, again, hesitation, I had to just have Andrew in this project. And then, and then um, he, just like everyone else in the team, he also had to provide two different uh, um, versions of audio sound, sound design for both versions. But as Nick briefly touched upon, Andrew had an amazing time with VR headset too, because designing the audio in Quill is just like moving around your speakers and, and then place them almost again like physically with, with the physical location. And then while in 2D um, traditional uh, cinema, that's then what you, when you, what you see on the photo, like you just bring up the, Pro tool and then do the sound designing. Really tedious work, but but I, to me, sound designers are like magicians. They really put like life to the what, what's not living. But that's Andrew. So that's it. You know, as you can see here, look how different, but also the same. These two images are. You know, the the painting I did ten years ago, and and the the literally screen, screen capture of the film you just watched. You know, um, things have been already there but there has been huge evolution since, you know, 10 years ago's painting to, you know, um, what, what we just today. And it's definitely thanks to many people's love, including Steph at Baobab and also external artists, including Nick and Awesome and, and you know, um, and Vanessa. And it was such an international collaboration. We had a artist from Germany, Canada, East Coast, like, I mean, I mean I'm talking about Connecticut and even the West Coast, we have Los Angeles, 
and most of the half of the production I was in Korea. So it was a amazing sort of like international collaboration. And here are the list of the full team. And today again we have uh Ah Sung Lee, art director, and then we have Nick Ladd, and we have Vanessa, and we have Kane Lee, um, one of the producers of the film together. So um here is um the parties two different small events we we had in once in new york and once in los angeles what's interesting is that you know because we were all working remotely we first met each other for the first time in this party so it was very touching but moving and weird bizarre experience you know um that you know i mean of course going through this crazy difficult pandemic we all experienced it together so it was another moment of appreciation of something we were so used to like seeing each other in eye to eye and being able to talk to each other and then and then and then watch the film together share the emotion together that was incredible amazing experience so yeah namu is definitely based on my life it is a story of a painter but painting and art is just a metaphor just a metaphor and symbol of the dream what you truly love and what makes you who you are so even though it is coming from a deeply personal space. I really hope people could resonate and find themselves in the story. So that's the story of Nam. Thank you, guys. And now we can. Invite, Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get it. Uh, we'll do our uh, switch our setup real quick, and we'll get everybody on here. Uh, so we'll get back. Uh, Nick, I don't need to be that big. Nick. Awesome, Kane and Vanessa it should be everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, yeah, I, beautiful film. Uh, as I was saying before, just kind of seeing the artistry in it, uh, how everybody kind of contributed. I'm very interested to hear. Uh, one of the first questions that that I had was, and it was also a question from the chat, is how does this experience making something in Quill differ uh, from your experiences doing uh, either a traditional animation pipeline or I know Bob's done a lot of other almost fully VR projects. Uh, how what, What's the difference in contrast and comparison there? Who wants to? <laughs> yeah, who wants to go first? That's a big one. So Awesome, awesome. You want to <laughs> share your thoughts? <laughs> 2D traditional versus quilting? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, let's see. I think as a designer perspective, you know, a lot of the previews is pretty similar, you know, like learning about the story, understanding the character and setting a direction is one thing for sure. But the biggest difference that VR brings in is that the cinematography aspect of it, like Eric and Nick kind of uh, uh, glided over. There is no such thing as cut. I mean, we have there are like trick cuts, but, you know, when things cut, it's more of a, like a teleport inside of VR or um, the immersiveness kind of forces you to design certain things a little bit more intentionally and just more carefully, I suppose. Um, and I think the pipeline too, like there was a lot of a collaborative process of me and Eric going into the VR many times and laying it out the scale and how it's, how big things should feel like or where things are supposed to be laid out in front of you so that um, the viewer in VR can have more immersive view versus Mm -hmm. You know, in 2D, uh, in traditional format, what you see in the camera is the reality. But, you know, in VR, you get to choose where to look. Uh, and that's not just about designs. Um, there's a lot of factors such as the, the orders of animations or where the eye would, lick, uh, eye, eye would lead. And that kind of things is something that I have to discuss a lot with Eric and then plan it ahead more than anything. Um, because there is a lot of back and forth, uh, you know, as things are being built by Nick and Dan and all the other amazing quill artists. But once it's animated, it's actually quite hard to fix because everything is mm. painted by hand. Uh, all the lighting is basically painted as well. Mm -hmm. So if I want to change, like, let's make this all seem blue instead of red, <laughs> then uh, <laughs> yes, that's a red flag from everywhere. <laughs> Um, so a lot yeah. of the planning has to be done, I think, in VR process than 2D. I mean, 2D is just as much planning as well, but there is not as not as there isn't as much of a um, room to like fix big things when things are far down the road. 
Um, I think I, I definitely those are the couple things that comes in my mind, my mind but um, feel free to chime in too. Um, yeah. Or if there's anything specific you're curious about the production, like that could differentiate between 2D and VR. Um, I think one thing that VR helped with was uh, it allowed us to keep our team quite small because uh, so many parts of the process could be done by a single artist or just our small team of artists. So in the end, it was only about three artists actually in Quill itself. So although the production outside of Quill was still extensive, there was audio and concept art and the director and all this stuff. But then in Quill, only three artists were required to model and uh, paint and animate all of this stuff. So in Quill, so many of the tools are kind of shared. The same tool you use to create is the same tool you use to animate. So an artist could could move quite quickly on their own and make a lot of progress uh, with with not quite as many uh, checks and not a pipeline that would block them. Yeah, I mean, just to give you a more uh, broader brushstrokes, there are literally six artists who actually end up going into the VR world. But mm -hmm. basically, as Nick said, there are only three people who actually literally design everything. Nick and Nick Led and Dan Frankie from from Germany, they did the entire design. And Nick did all the object animation. And then we had John Brower. He single-handedly did all the character animation. And then, oh, wow. and then Awesome, myself, and Javier Moya, who uh, now is an Pixar animator, three of us were basically supporters. We were basically mm -hmm. giving the guidance, guidance and the notes and, and switching ideas. But basically, three of them, including Nick, were really the one who hard carried everything. So if you are doing this in traditional CG pipeline, I don't even know how the budget and team and yeah. Brian, yeah. Yeah. It's almost like it sounds like it's almost an inverse of like the traditional CG pipeline where it's like the pre production would be s s big but still small, but then the amount of team you would need to make the assets, the models, the rigs, the textures, all of that is usually quite large. And this is almost an inverse, maybe in in that way, where you're having to think about it, like you were saying, also you can't you can't change everything later and say make it all blue or make it all red or let's change it. So you kind of have to have that thought out beforehand. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, I think, is somewhat, it's somewhat, like, similar to 2D production than a 3D production. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, yeah, like, just like uh, Nick explained, there's no rigging or there's no, like, a one model that's a, that's applied to everything. And everything has to be made for that scene. And there are so many more assets than, um, you know, as if you're making, like, a 2D project even though it lives in 3D. And I think that mm -hmm. kind of helped in some way to create a certain style too. So, um, Well, I loved uh, in your presentation where you were showing that you could even use yeah. Quill being almost like a 3D illustration program mm -hmm. to use what looked like 2D effects, meaning like this is the direction that something will go. We're just going to quickly mock this up and then we'll animate where that will go later. But you can, that's a very 2D storyboard style seemingly, which is cool to see in 3D and in VR at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because the VR technology is so advanced and yet uh, the, the, as an animation tool and as an illustration tool, it goes back to kind of almost like a, pre-computer like sort of style where you're the computer is not assisting with all the animation as it does in something like Maya. I mean, you, have, you do a lot in Maya as well, but um, it's really more playing with your hands and doing like little, you know, it's more like a stop motion or 2D than it would mm -hmm. be like working in something like Maya. There's no, it's a lot less technical of a process, despite the fact that it's a more, you know, advanced technology, you'd expect it to be more tech, Nickel, but it's actually less, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Just because it reintroduces your your actual human hands into the process. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I guess kind of a question uh, for Kane. This is there's a VR version of this, and there's a a two D version of this. Uh, is that common for most Bayabal projects? I mean, I think it comes down to the creative, um, and definitely for Namu, um, we've been thinking about both since the very beginning. Um, mm -hmm. So um, when uh, Eric um, shared his vision with the studio, I mean, first of all, everything has to resonate with us creatively. And, you know, um, he, he mentioned this earlier, we were in Korea two summers ago and, um, you know, he showed me some of that earliest artwork um, that he had tucked away for over a decade. Um, and I sort of knew right away that um, it was ready to, uh, to be shared and that um, we should get him into the studio right away. 
Um, and every, we had a lot of fans in our studio of Eric's previous work. Um, and they all left the room in tears. And, um, <laughs> you know, and, and we never, we, we were never like, oh, this has to be VR or this has to be 2D. We're, we were kind of like, this is one of those rare um, pieces where it just feels like it could, it could equally exist in both. Um, <laughs> and then also, uh, you know, like, there's a belief we have fundamentally actually at our studio. Um, it comes all the way down from our chief creative officer, Eric Darnell, um, that sort of the most undeniable stories and characters um, can, can transcend mediums. Um, so that we don't get too hung up on the either or of it all. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like that is kind of like the older model of maybe um, producing in Hollywood. And I think, you know, we kind of uh, want to embrace being a different kind of animation studio um, where as long as you know, we are, um, you know, working with, uh, as long as we remain very creative driven and we're having incredibly high standards about who we work with, whether it be, you know, Disney Plus on streaming or John Legend on, you know, something music related or Random House on books or Eric O on uh, something that is, um, you know, so deeply personal, but then we felt that it might have the ability to connect with a wider audience. Um, then we're, you know, we're going to, we're going to go for it. And, um, you know, it was more of an idea to us, whether it's in VR or 2D, and we really felt it could be in both. Um, mm -hmm. Charles Solomon, the famous animation historian, he called some of Eric's previous work uh, the filmic equivalent of haiku. Um, <laughs> that was very exciting to us because that means what does it mean to tell a story, to, to make a poem come to life through animation? Can we do it both theatrically so that it can wash over audiences while they're sitting on the edge of their seat and, and feeling what Roger Ebert called like the empathy machine power of cinema. Um, and we really felt strongly that Namu could do this um, if we, you know, worked together really hard and made it happen. And then, um, and then with uh, uh, all the tools we used uh, in VR for the last five years and our sort of expertise in that space, what would it be like to be with this little child growing up to becoming a young man, growing up to be an old man and being with him as he looks back on his tree of life throughout time, what would it feel like to be with him there um, like you can only do inside of VR? So we, um, you know, we felt uniquely equipped to, that we would be able to do both and um, we're proud of um, um, what we came up with. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm pretty familiar with your work and I've seen all this and this one just only for Bill, it feels like a different type of storytelling. It feels like a different Thing entirely which is which is awesome uh you had mentioned this and i know that eric you had it earlier so i wanted to kind of bring this to light but uh you were in korea when you met and i believe kane you're korean american uh eric is korean and Osong is korean and also at the beginning of the film uh john cho uh is the ep on this so i wanted to hear a little bit about the korean influence in this I don't know who that question is for but just generally maybe for eric or i mean yeah yeah i mean maybe kane and i can share you know, from each other's perspective. But for me, you know, as Kane also pointed out, it was all coming from creative itself because from the get go, you know, we didn't plan to title our title in Korean, you know, it wasn't there. I was just trying to make something very personal. That was all. I was pulling and drawing all the vignettes and memories and the stories from my own childhood memories and, and the thoughts and emotion I have, you know. So basically, um, being coming from, uh, I was born in the States, but I was raised in uh, Korea for the most of my childhood and in youth. Of course, I couldn't, you know, uh, um, it doesn't make sense not to talk about it, right? So uh, we see a lot of small Easter, fun Easter eggs that Koreans could catch, but that doesn't, you know, it only it's only just fun fact, literally. You know, it doesn't even, it's not like if you don't know them, you don't understand the film. It's not like that. It's still universal mm -hmm. story that can be understood by any age or any culture. So that was really it. And and, and it all started from there. Naturally, as I said, Awesome, you know, in, in you know, being a Korean was the least <laughs> criteria for me though. <laughs> I really love his work. Literally, seriously. And he's not only a great art director, he's a great filmmaker too. So I was relying on him as a storytelling too a lot. So and and then Kane, I happened to be with Kane in Korea, so everything was just natural and smooth. Nothing was planned, right? Um, Kane, any, any thought from your side? <laughs> I mean, I, I just think it's um, sort of an undeniable part of it, but not 
so not like very consciously so i think it was very much like um organically a part of it because of you know eric's sort of very strongly bicultural background as a filmmaker um and um you know and, and honestly like there's something about the film that was really about sort of um honoring you know those who came before us who paved the way ahead of us you know and so uh when you have um, some of the key players um, on that i think that's going to come out uh in the experience um but then uh you know it, it's we really uh embrace it for the universality but also really loving the fact that uh, when eric pitched this to us it felt like one of those projects where as he went in more deeply personal into the specificity uh, into these little details that they that they could actually make it feel more relatable to people and more um you know like authentic in terms of what he's bringing there and if there are certain elements to it there's so much information that's why vanessa also did such an amazing job as our editor of like packing in a lot of detail and story but then giving it a lot of space space and room to breathe um, in certain key moments and i think that like finding that balance that balancing act throughout the entire film uh, whether or not you're seeing something that is more common across cultures or some certain little easter eggs um you know like the ramen noodles that are like a little bit more specific to certain cultures um that everyone is kind of like being able to put themselves into um into this character and, and history of life and thinking about their own Absolutely. I wanted to jump over to Vanessa real quick to talk a little about the story. Uh, like you just said, Kane, we basically watched a whole person's life in 12 minutes. Um, that's a lot to fit into 12 minutes, but you also don't want to rush it. There's not a ton of action. You want it to be slow and, and, and feel it. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the, the process of editing, uh, editing something that's going and working in VR to being now in a 2D medium sounds mm -hmm. challenging. So maybe just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's a it's actually a, a fascinating editorial experience to get to, to work in both. Uh, I've done it for a few times with Baobab now, taken a VR project, worked in VR as editor, and moved over to moved it over to to D, 2D. Um, and as Eric already mentioned, it's it's essentially a translation. That's what it is. It's it's as if you're you're essentially taking a story that exists and then translating into a whole other language. And so it's kind of fascinating because in general, editorial story in general, from an editorial perspective, is just pacing. That is just what it is, the definition of editing. Um, and in a VR space, because it's immersive, because it's, I always liken it much more to theater. It's much more like theater. If you think about it, you know, if you sit down, it's not theater, but it's more like theater in its format and in the medium. And if you think about the all the tools that theater uses to tell stories, to tell their stories, a lot of it is, you know, audio based for you to know where to turn a lot of its lighting cues you know if you think about mm. watching a play and then it all goes dark but one character gets a spotlight that's similar to the translation of a close-up in 2d so there but it's not the same it's it's just that's the translation tool so that's where the language is different you know a close-up is as if it's a spotlight with maybe a sound cue to turn your head over here that's much more like vr so if you think about trying to tell a story using the, that language of more theater-based language it's a different pacing altogether even when the emotional journey has is the same journey the way it hits and where certain information gets given when is really different depending on the language so that was the challenge it's always a challenge but but if you're an editor like myself it's such a fun challenge i i love the uh, translation and adaptation is kind of it's such a fun such a fun process in, in my opinion so for namu it was it was really it was no different in that if you think about the spacing in quill there's all this pacing that happened in the quill project and then it kind of existed in this immersive 3d space the timing kind of existed the way that it did from a VR co perspective. So coming into 2D, it was a lot of looking at it from you know, kind of afar, seeing that pacing and being like, oh, let's close in here. And sometimes we would choose a shot, but it would be like, oh, we'd, we'd, we'd love it for, to, for the camera to be pointed this way. And then there would be no background or the background would be, crazy. <laughs> be like, oh, okay, never, never, never mind. Oh, Oops, we yeah. don't want to close up, but let's change it a little bit this way. So it's kind of this great, I don't know, it really depends on what kind of creative you are, but I love creative creativity with limitations. And mm -hmm. so it was, it was part, this is what that was. And it was, it was such a great time. And it was 
such a blast to work with Eric as well and trying to figure that all out because I think it's tough to have worked and been in a mindset of VR, 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 and then just switch over to 2D. It really was nice. My, I was kind of fresh eyes on that. And I think it, was, it really helped to have that, like, Eric side being like, well, this is kind of what we were going for here. And then to be able to understand for that translation. So it was a totally. great experience. That's awesome. Eric, speaking of, like, basically making the film and transitioning and trying to capture your initial vision and maybe, was this your first time ever doing a film using VR? It was my first time, yes. It was. What was like? What were some of the big changes you had to make, or was it what you expected it to be, like from the very beginning, or what was like the biggest surprises for you working in VR as a director? I mean, what Vanessa pointed out exactly, I don't know how much better I could explain, but those are really the how different cinema and VR is, and and mm. I thought I knew. But as soon as I opened the box, okay, I knew nothing. Never mind. So <laughs> every step of the way, I was learning. And thanks to really Bell Bob and also Vanessa, who has some experience previously with you know switching over between VR and cinema. You know, uh, I was able to get right guidance. You know, so but we went over a variety of different directions. For example, um, one version in VR, VR, for example, we had a version with, with that require uh, that uh, provides uh, interactivity. You can control the pacing, or or should we make help have the, the the audience walk around, be able to walk around? You know, we did actually explore those directions, but after going over many different explorations and directions, and this is why we landed. And um, yeah, that was really it. And as Vanessa said, it was such a fascinating experience for me because at the end of the day, it feels like it made me become a better filmmaker because even if I I don't have immediate plan to do another VR content, but I'll probably do in the future because it's so fun. It's really enables you to do much more bigger, you know, storytelling in, in different angles. But even coming back to traditional filmmaking, you know, I think I have now other part of the brain that really supports to see beyond, you know, what I feel mm. seeing from the narrow minded perspective. So, yeah. That's really cool. Um, question for Asong. Uh, I was curious about the art style that you and Eric chose. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Mm, yeah. Um, I feel like a lot of uh, big points of the art direction is included in the presentation before. So I'm, <laughs> I might be uh, uh, saying that again. But um, as far as the art direction goes, I think the biggest thing is what was in the presentation, which was the sense of time through. Mm -hmm. And we had like the idea of having a season that parallels with the life of the num parallel with the life of the tree and also the character. And that kind of like brought everything together into a nice um, frame. And from there, we try to like, you know, when it's young, it's more about pastel color. And um, as, the, as the character grows and forms more of the personality in the shape of the tree, the color becomes more variant too, uh, more vivid too, and then so on and on and on. Um, but the biggest thing that I really loved about Namu is that, you know, as a style of storytelling, it has certain kind of a, like a room to breathe, like for audience to fill in the gaps, you know? And I think a lot of that had to be reflected in the art side as well. Like as much as it is very intricate and complex with the objects that represents certain point of the person's life, I wanted to make sure that it is still very airy and the use of negative space as a part of the tool. A negative space, it becomes more of a, like a tool to also um, create very uh, all, um, <clears throat> dominant color sets. And throughout the film, like, because it doesn't have crazy amount of like a location change. Well, it does change like a landscape wise and tree wise, but the location itself is not changing drastically, right? So I had to rely a lot, a lot on the light color and I had to rely a lot on the negative space and the kind of watercolor style part of that um, art direction. Um, so I think in, in, in some, it is like a somewhat 2D watercolor inspired 3D style, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, in the beginning, um, Nick and Dan have introduced me a lot of great quill art, uh, quill uh, projects that been done before. and. And um, we got to collaborate a lot on what kind of style works the best. 
and especially you know to be mindful about the technological aspect of it as well um, what it can do versus what it's challenging to do certain things right on that note i have to thank our amazing cool artists for that um were there any concessions that you had to make for like you know maybe you made a piece of concept art and then nick is saying like that's not possible or we're not you know is there any, anything in that regard or was it pretty one-to-one -one? um i mean nick you can fit for the charm but one, one thing that i remember is like because it's about because uh eric's very initial drawing was very watercolor, which has a lot of textures, and there is something mm. very like a tactile about that style itself, the way things bleed or the edging work. And um, in the in the beginning, it, all of that cannot be achieved in Quill, but there's a certain level of like a textural work that Nick and Dan, Nick especially, created it with by just using those simple brushes by hand painting every bits of the texture to create textures or um there's also i think certain quill trick to create certain type of layering um and i was just so, like mind blown how they were able to execute it based on the psd like a photoshop file that i created and um but i also remember there were times like because of the file size or um, the sky wise, there was a lot of going back and forth about optimizing the size of the gradients or um, mm. how things should blend into things. I mean, technical things, I mean, Nick, you can add a little bit more about that too. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, the, the VR version wasn't just um, a VR version. It also had to be functional on kind of mobile VR headsets. So. Mm. When we're working in Quill, we're working on kind of PC. So with the PC VR, we can go pretty far. Like in Quill directly, we could we could translate a lot of our songs designs. But then we had to make sure it was still, you know, performant when we went on to the Oculus Quest, which was uh, it's basically just a mobile phone level kind of headset. I mean, it's more advanced than that. But you know, it, we couldn't if if we put in uh, twice as many objects in each scene, it would have started to to chug a little right. bit too much. So uh, and as an animator, the way that you kind of grab and move characters is you grab their strokes, you select them, and you move them. So if every character had been covered in, like, hundreds of little things, it would have been easy to accidentally leave strokes behind. So the simplicity of the art style was um, was also to kind of make it easier for the animator so we weren't kind of tearing our hair out with tiny, tiny details. Um, sure, losing those pieces. or Yeah, yeah exactly. That's awesome. And I think having Quill kind of helped the style too, where, because um, there were a lot of places where I wanted to keep it rough just by having like squiggly lines or mm -hmm. very painterly aspect of it. Instead of using like texture brush, I um, I was hoping to do it with all very thin lines by just scratching it or uh, filling it in very roughly. And um, Nick, Nick actually executed it just exactly into the final painting, so all the all the objects are not entirely too clean. Um, it has mm -hmm. that handmade feel to it, and all those stuff had to be like very intentionally designed, like size of the brushes or um, how much details we want or how much details we want to take out to create somewhat impressionistic version of a uh, which would have been very clean 3D film, um, and that was part of a big style as well. To, to make that little closer to the painterly feeling, not necessarily all the way to watercolor, uh, but just to find the balance between what's simple and um, handmade feel versus still polished and finished look as a 3D film. That's awesome. Uh, got a couple questions from the chat, one of which was, you know, you're basically seemingly doing this almost frame by frame. Right, it's very similar to 2D in that way, where you can take an object, you can move it, and you can squash it, and it seems like you almost take like a snapshot of that object at that moment, like uh, stop motion. Um, does that make the the production time a lot longer, or is it like is it fast to animate a scene? Is it slow to animate a scene in like comparison? It's um, I wouldn't. No, I don't, it's kind of hard to say. You can move quite quickly on it. It's surprisingly mm -hmm. fast. Like you would expect in betweening to be a very, very slow process. Mm -hmm. and in some ways it is, but the process of actually kind of blocking these characters, um, I would say blocking and doing the breakdowns is a lot faster typically than doing it in 3D because uh, you're not working, you're not working with uh, kind of handles to kind of 
bend things, you're not working with numbers, you're just kind of grabbing and intuitively moving and bending with them, which is, you know, it's fast. Uh, kind of like a puppet, yeah. Yeah, it's a puppet. And if you start to do things like uh, Anon Brush, where you can kind of draw the rain, you can draw the effects, you can grab tool, you can kind of puppet, that stuff's all extremely quick and, and intuitive. Hmm. Um, the area where it, it does slow down would be the kind of in-betweening, which... Um, you know, it's just kind of a tedious uh, part of the process, the same as it would be in, in 2D animation. But mm -hmm. the process leading up to that is is much faster, I would say. Very cool. Uh, on average, you know, you're working in Quill. Uh, how many hours a day would you spend in Quill? Is it like eight hours a day? Are you there for like two hours a day? I'm very curious as somebody who spent some time in VR, but not as much as you. Uh, I would say, I mean... It depends on the day, depends on what's going on in, in the week, but it's not all Quill. There's a lot of back and forth with, you know, talking with the team outside of Quill. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, if I had to say, I mean, it would vary between three to eight hours, but I mean, often there would be lots of breaks in between. It's not, I'm not wearing the headset all day long. It's lots of breaks and yeah. Awesome. But I think it's, yeah, it's, it's really the only, the really biggest problem with wearing the headset is just the, um, the weight of certain headsets is heavier than mm -hmm. others. So mm -hmm. the Oculus Quest, which is kind of the most common headset these days, is a lot heavier than the Rift headsets mm -hmm. because that headset's meant to be used standalone. So all the hardware is in the headset itself, so it, it's kind of front heavy versus mm -hmm. the old one, which relies on the computer for power. So, um, But yeah, the old headsets uh, especially are actually very mm -hmm. really comfortable for long sessions. A little bit lighter. Yeah, I have a Quest myself, and if I spend more than like... 90 minutes in it, I feel it like on the front of my face and you get super sweaty too. So yeah, I was yeah. curious about that. Yeah, they're great. Uh, but I keep an old headset around for my, uh, for my work like this. Awesome. One thing I love to make sure that is Nick Ladd is the best cool artist, the most disciplined, most, you know, expert. I mean, if you see him doing his magic, it's really like a magic. So to me, the question is hard to answer because it is just like drawing or painting. Like if mm -hmm. you have your watercolor and brush, it's all about craftsmanship. It's all about draftsmanship. So you really actually do need a time to practice and get used to this environment to go as fast as Nick. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, if anyone can draw with the pencil, anyone can be an artist, right? So it's not about pencil or brush. It's really about how much you're dedicated and you know um, practice and, and get used to this environment, in my opinion. So. Yeah. yeah, for me, the, the headset is really like a 3D equivalent of like a Cintiq tablet, um, mm. which is really the reason I, I bought it initially as well was just I have a background in 2D illustration and 3D, so I wanted to kind of bridge that gap, and so Quill was perfect. And uh, as a 3D equivalent of a Cintiq, that's basically what I've been using it as. That's great. Yeah, I've played around with some, and I know some of our viewers and uh, students have as well. We have a VR lab where we've used mostly put uh, Unreal things into uh, VR and stuff like that. But I think for this project, Unity was also used. Is that correct? Uh, how was is, how is Unity used in conjunction with Quill? Uh, I mean, I can speak to it, I think. Uh, sure. I think Vanessa, you might be muted. I think you were part of that process. But uh, the VR version didn't use any Unity. Um, hmm. The VR version was was kind of all built in Quill entirely, but hmm. we use Unity for the the two D version basically to do our captures and to uh, to put cameras and and all that stuff. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So we basically, we exported to Quill everything done in Quill to Unity, and then as Nick said, the camera cinematography was done in Unity, and we exported, uh, uh, you know that footage to uh, um, Premiere, basically. And then that's where um, Vanessa put all everything together. But of course, in the middle, we have a semi-effects, post-effects uh, procedure too, that was done by FFX, uh, by, uh, um, you know, Natan Mora. So that was another procedure. But basically, long story short, that's the process. So Quill and camera on Unity and, and everything put together in Premiere. Oh, very cool. That's cool. I had never really thought about that process of how you would, because I guess it maybe the doesn't have. Yeah, have the to, shot yeah. creation. Yeah, exactly. Unity is uh, meant for that. It's it's you know the system that makes that eat that translation easier. So. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, 
Well, that is actually all of our questions, and we're just about to wrap up on time. I didn't know if there was any cl closing thoughts from anybody here, but I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for spending the time uh, making this, first off. Uh, there was one last question that I actually did have, and I, I, it seems like you had said this in your presentation, but you had basically created in a fully remote team, bef but did this start pre-pandemic or during pandemic? I was curious about that. Can you want to take the production? Sure. Um, so we started a little bit before the pandemic. And mm -hmm. um, actually, as a studio, we faced two choices. One was to try to get as many people in the Bay Area together so that we can work together because, you know, obviously um, that's more the traditional way of working. Um, or, um, you know, as we were all, so many of us were doing this, uh, doing something for the first time, you know, like mm. Eric is working in VR for the first time. Our, production manager, this was actually her very first production. I mean, there were on all different fronts, there were many unknowns, um, but we decided to go with like the A team, um, no matter where they were and no matter what time zone. And it was something that um, our uh, um, production and engineering departments had actually kind of mapped out and we had decided to do it um, several months before the pandemic hit. So weirdly, um, you know, when it hit, we weren't impacted in any way because we had actually set this up uh, right beforehand so um it was very serendipitous for the for the for the making of namu that we had actually um considered going remote and actually had um embraced it um before the pandemic um and then there was that added um you know that added layer of like wow we're working remotely some of us have never met each other um mm -hmm. <laughs> and um and here we are creating a piece of storytelling about you know looking you know, at your own mortality in a new way, as the entire world was doing the same thing, and we were all separated from each other, except, um, you know, through Zoom and VR. So um, it was on kind of hitting us on multiple levels that this there was something very special, um, and almost very magical feeling about this project, um, because it was almost like it was meant to be able to sustain itself during, um, you know, this huge change in human history. Um, and at the same time, um, it, it kind of made us very passionate and very emotionally moved because we saw so much of what was happening around us. Um, and we were able to put that into um, Eric's sort of amazing story of this one man's life journey and, and um, you know, taking that great pause in all of our life to think about what is um, really important and has affected and um, we're at the direction that our trees of life are going. Um, so yeah, it was just, uh, just very special and, um, meaningful for all of us. Awesome. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, super appreciate you being able to be here today. Making the film is very, it's very moving and inspirational and just kind of seeing something that's, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's a really beautiful film. I don't have a lot to say. It's just very beautiful and appreciate the artistry in it. So thank you all very, very much. Uh, and thank you all for being here. And thank you for uh, being on our stream today. Thank, thank you. you so much, Josh. Thank you so much. Thank you no so problem. much, everyone. Thank you. Um, some housekeeping. We'll be doing a bunch more streams for the rest of the week. So check us out on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. We have a bunch of streams uh, wherever you're streaming now. Uh, but otherwise, you know, Follow, like, subscribe, and you'll get some more notifications for cool events like this. So feel free to do that. Uh, otherwise, we will see you all next stream. Thank you all very much. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.